Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, first 2014 meeting of the uh, DEP's Oil and Gas Technical Advisory Board. Uh, I'm Gary Slagle. I've been asked to uh, function as the chair for this morning's event. Our, uh, our official chair, Dr. Robert Watson, Penn State University, uh, was not able to make it. So uh, uh, the members here asked me to, to function in that temporary capacity. I think to make things official, what I'd like to do is uh, ask for a motion to, to confirm my functioning as uh, chairman for the day. So uh, can I have a motion to do so? Gary, I'll make that motion. Okay. Sure. Thank Second. you. Second. Second. By Art. Okay. All in favor, aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, this is our, as I mentioned, this is our first meeting uh, of the year. Uh, we've got some very significant issues uh, upcoming, uh, not only in front of us today, but uh, coming up over the next uh, probably 12 months as we look at uh, various subchapters of Chapter 78. Uh, today's meeting will be basically just a briefing. We don't anticipate any, uh, well, in fact, we, we know there will not be any official action by this board on any of the issues being discussed today. We're basically looking at concepts as well as a review of comments DEP has received. And as you see on your agenda, uh, those are spelled out uh, clearly so uh, you understand how we're going to proceed for the day. Um, we have uh, a couple public comment peer, uh, opportunities uh, today. And I've been told that anyone uh, that has signed up to make public comment is going to have to use the microphone over here next to Mr. Adams uh, so that uh, we can make sure that uh, this is carried through the uh, webinar uh, uh, communication mechanism. And uh, everyone both here as well as uh, listening online will be able to uh, understand uh, what's being said. So that being said, and I also want to mention that uh, uh, Deputy Director or Deputy Secretary Scott Perry uh, was called into a 10 o'clock meeting. He will be here about 1030. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I'll ask uh, Mr. Klepkowski to go ahead and give some of the introductory remarks for DEP. Kurt. Thank you, Gary. Um, on behalf of the department, I'd like to, uh, to welcome everybody here uh, in the room in Harrisburg as well as on the webinar. Um, it's a very important meeting in order to move some of these regulatory concepts forward. And so we very much appreciate your participation and your uh, attendance here today. I guess, uh, as Gary mentioned, today is primarily more of a, in the nature of an update meeting rather than an action meeting. Uh, looking at the agenda, the first issue uh, the presentation that I'm going to give will be relating to the public comments received during the recent comment period on the Chapter 78, Subchapter C, Surface Activities proposed rulemaking. There will be a public comment period and a break for lunch. And then in the afternoon, when we return from lunch, we'll be talking about a summary document of proposed conceptual changes to Subchapter D, which is the subsurface activities rulemaking, uh, as well as some relatively minor changes to subchapter H, which relates to underground gas storage. And our subsurface activities folks will be joining us at that time to go over those items. And there will also be a second public comment period availability um, at that point to go over any questions that folks might have about the information that was presented at that time. I think to, to start things off, it'd probably be useful for us to go around the room and if folks could introduce themselves and who they're here representing, that would be, that would be great. Uh, my name is Kirk Klapkowski. I'm the director of the Bureau of Oil and Gas Planning and Program Management for Pennsylvania DEP. It's the headquarters unit of the Oil and Gas Management Program here in Harrisburg. Um, then I'll go to my right. Hi, good morning. My name is Elizabeth Nolan. I'm an assistant counsel in DEP's Bureau of Regulatory Counsel, and I'm the oil and gas program attorney. Okay. Art Yingling, Tab. Uh, Bert Wade, the Citizens Advisory Council. Uh, Appointment to TAB. Uh, Gary Slagle, TAB. I'm Jessica Shirley. I'm with the DEP Policy Office. And I'm Joe Lee. I'm uh, Chief of uh, Compliance and Data Management for the Bureau of uh, Pro uh, Planning and Program Management for Oil and Gas. Joe Adams with the Service Activities Division uh, under Kurt. 
Okay, why don't we just go through the audience? And I know that won't be picked up very clearly, but uh, at least for the benefit of those in the room here. Ma'am? Lori Barr, Save Our Streets PA. I mean, a host executive director of League of Women Voters in Pennsylvania. Gene Sides, Babs Callen. Todd Wallace, Office of Oil and Gas Management. John Todd, DE from Construction Contracts. And Matthew T. A. Dewsby. Chris George Schwartz, Apex Companies. Ben Straub. Tom Yarny, next to DO Energy. Joe Berg, on behalf of API. Miriam Modai, Weber Associates. Katie Culinary, State Impact, Pennsylvania. Laura Lugier, the Pittsburgh. Joseph Stein, legal intern for GED. Lucia Grandel, oil and gas management. Kathy Kirsch, oil and gas management. Wendy Carson, Assistant Counsel for DCNR. Gina Myers, Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney. Scott Charles, Regulatory Review Commission. Jeff Walentowski, Ruby and Associates. Stephen Brogenshire, DEP, Oil and Gas. Joe Kelly, DEP, Oil and Gas. Tracy McCurdy, TV Faction. Angela Lee, Mary and Patrick Schroeder, Engineering. With Jeff Powell, who began. And work a lot in DEP communications. Rainwell Stan and Darko. Okay. And Tony Holtzman with Daniel Gates. John Kara, Bureau of Forestry. Brian Sears, Bureau of Forestry. Annalise Blake, Chip Chesapeake. Lauren Domingo, to speak. Okay. Okay, thank you. Oh, folks in the corner here. Stan Klapkowski, uh, yes, and a citizen of Pennsylvania. Yeah, it's my father. So. <laughs> <laughs> in case you couldn't tell from the. Uh, <laughs> A unique last name. Uh, anyways, um, so I'm a little I'm a little nervous today. <laughs> you have to excuse me. It's not often. Uh, it's a it's an honor and a privilege to be able to uh, to do my job in a way that um, my father is able to witness. So wow, great. I'm pleased that he could be here today. That is, uh, it's not actually on the the printed agenda, but the uh, the one item of business that we wanted to take care of for the board was um, to actually take a look at the minutes from last June. The draft minutes and get those officially approved. They they haven't gone through the official approval process. So, I, I did read the minutes. I'll uh, I'll make a motion to accept those minutes. Okay, I'll second that. And corrections, uh, sir. All right. Uh, any comments, questions? Okay. Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I'd uh, be remiss if I didn't take a, just a real quick moment to point out that uh, the minutes and the administrative support that we get for these meetings is uh, Derek Jagela in uh, the Bureau of Office and Oil and Gas Management. Um, I know Derek's over in the corner working hard right now, So, but I wanted to make sure that I made mention of the hard work that he does and the excellent minutes that he provides us after each of these meetings. Um, so with the, with the administrative stuff out of the way, why don't we get right into the... Uh, the summary of comments received on the proposed rulemaking. Um, I, just as sort of a, an opening piece, I wanted, to, I wanted to mention some things about the technical side of, of what's happening here uh, with regard to the webinar. Um, on the screen now for the, for the webinar in the room and also for those folks who are participating through the webinar, there is uh, contact information there. Uh, the dial-in number for the audio and the PIN number uh, to access that, the audio stream. And if th there's a technical support number there, uh, we cannot provide technical support. So if you're having, if you're having technical issues with the webinar, uh, the number on the screen there is the number you need to call to try to get that worked out. Um, the last piece to mention sort of administratively before we get into the substance of this uh, with regard to the webinar is that the, the chat windows have been disabled for the webinar. And if um, anyone who's participating through the webinar has a comment or question that they'd like to have uh, answered during the public comment period. The email address is there on the, on the first screen and it's, it's also on some of the following screens as well as we go through the PowerPoint. Um, it's ra-epthepolicyoffice -E or ra-ep the policy office at pa.gov. So with that um, beginning information out of the way, why don't we go ahead and get into it if I, my clicker's working here. Yeah, it's, they say you should always practice uh, 
before you do audiovisual work, and uh, this is probably a prime example of that. Let's see here. Now the laser pointer is working. Yeah. Any ideas? Okay. Was that me or was that you? <laughs> okay. I'll just point this over to you, and then you can. Uh, so. I, I don't think it's going to come as a surprise to anybody in this room, and it's probably not anybody who's participating on the webinar. Uh, this was, this was a, a regulatory process that's generated a, an intense amount of interest. I've been working in this field for almost 21 years now, and I've never seen a rulemaking that's gone through this sort of a public process, public development, and public interest. And, and as an initial matter, I'd just like to say thank you to all the citizens and to all the folks representing the in industry and uh, the environmental groups uh, in this commonwealth and around the country, frankly, who took the time to look, take a look at the proposed rulemaking, try to understand it, ask questions, develop very thoughtful comments. Frankly, it's, um, it, it, from, a, from an eighth grade civics perspective, it's been a very educational experience to see when we walk out with a public participation process like this, how people really rise to that challenge. And, uh, and it's really, it was really a, um, it was very intense, but it was also very rewarding, I think, both in terms of just seeing the actual citizen involvement, participation, but also the, uh, the very thoughtful and detailed comments that we received. And the, the purpose of this presentation today is to give everyone a, basically a summary of where we are in terms of what we received and, and the substance of those comments so that we can start to begin to have the discussion about where we go as we draft final rulemaking. So the draft regulation was published in December 2013, uh, originally had a 60-day public comment period that was extended to 90 days uh, at the request and urging of, of many, many folks. Uh, we also had nine public hearings scheduled. Originally there were only seven, but it was in each of the six DEP regions around the state. Again, at the urging of, uh, of citizens, we added two public hearings to that roster, one in uh, the southwestern part of the state and one in Warren, Pennsylvania, where a lot of the conventional oil and gas operations are located, um, which meant that we ended up with two public hearings uh, in the north central, two public hearings in the southwest, one in the northwest, um, one in the northeast, and one each in south central and southeast. Because, of course, excuse me, while the actual development is not occurring in those areas, there is a great deal of public interest in, in this topic, frankly, and these regulations as well. So we felt that it was important to, to step out in those, in those places. And at the public hearings, we got somewhere around 300 persons, individuals who came and testified, representing uh, everything from individual individuals to industry organizations, individual operators, municipal governments, um, emergency response personnel. Uh, so it was a very wide, broad range of a spectrum of the, of the citizenry of the Commonwealth that came out to those public hearings. And again, some of those public hearings were held in not ideal conditions. The one in Washington and the one in Tunkhannock in particular were part of our uh, polar vortex kind of time in this, if, from this winter. And so for the folks who managed to brave the cold and, and make it out those evenings, it was very much appreciated. In terms, of the, in terms of the written public comments themselves, this, this rulemaking was, was interesting in that it was the first time recently that we've stepped out with an electronic online submission form so that folks could go to the DEP website and they could actually enter their comments in directly through an electronic submission form. So rather than necessarily emailing it or printing it out a hard copy of a document and sending it to us, it was, we tried to make it as easy as possible for folks to have as many different methods as possible to get their comments to us on the rulemaking. And by the end of the day, we're somewhere around 25,000 letters, emails, uh, signatures on petitions, uh, documents that were, that were sent to us, hard copy, and, and they came through that electronic uh, submission process. The, the number's not fixed yet. I, we're, even though it's, we're a couple months out from the, from the end of the public comment period, we are still compiling this document. So we're, we don't exactly have a fixed number yet, but it's around 25,000. Um, it'll maybe go a little higher, a little lower as we, as we consolidate some of them or as we, as we f finish adding the, the ones that we have into the, into the comment response document that we're working on now. But out of those 25,000, we think we had about 1,200 to 1,500 what I'll call unique commentators. And by that I mean 
uh, an individual comment that came in that was either from an individual or from an, from an entity or an organization that was not a form letter or not a part of a petition or not sort, sort of a me too kind of a comment. Um, now, that's 12 to 1500 uh, comments or commentators. Each one of those may have a significant number of comments included within that individual document. So for example, um, Earth Justice submitted a, a, about a 120 page comment letter on behalf of a number of environmental organizations. And so obviously in that, we're counting that as one in that 1200 to 1500 range, but th that individual document probably has anywhere north of three to 400 individual comments about the entire rulemaking. Similarly, we got a, a very detailed comment letters from uh, the Pennsylvania Independent Oil and Gas Association and some of the other associations where, again, it's a very large document that's very comprehensively going through the regulations. So instead of simply saying, ban pits, they say, I have a comment about this particular section and maybe in some cases even submitting proposed rulemaking changes to us. So here's my comment and here's an amendatory language to the proposal to, to reflect my comment. So I think the number when, you, when we finally have the comment and response document wrapped up and, and right now we're going through the process of consolidating some of these comments because some of the comments are very similar even if they're from different individuals or entities. Um, I think we'll, we'll probably see that, that 1,200 number. I, I'm guessing that we're going to end up with several thousand more individual, individual unique comments about individual unique portions of the rulemaking uh, as a result of, of all the stripping out all of the comments from those 12 to 1,500 unique commentators. And then we got somewhere in the neighborhood of 22,000 form letters and petition signatures. And interestingly, the, the t I would probably classify the, the form letters into two groups, one of which was environmental organizations that, that reached out to their membership and said, we'd like you to submit this, this information um, uh, to, the, to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And probably, um, it's roughly two thirds of those 22,000 probably came in through those types of actions, clean water action and move on, had a petition. I think the, I think the, top, the top submitter was probably Penn Environment. Uh, we ended up with somewhere north of 6,600 emails from, from their members. Um, talking about four particular points. But um, the, other, the other interesting side of it is we heard a lot from the conventional industry. So, so folks who were working in the conventional industry who were from that area, who maybe work in businesses that, were, that, that supply that industry or otherwise are engaged with that industry. We also got a significant number of, of um, what I would categorize as form letters uh, from, that, from that aspect of the, of the industry as well. So it was environmental groups over here and the conventional industry over here. And in terms of the unconventional industry, they tended to be more the submission of individual comments from individual operators or the associations that are associated with that side of the industry. Kirk, can you uh, opine on, uh, of the comments received, maybe it's basically or the, the unique comments, uh, how many not only uh, offered a comment, but uh, also suggested something constructive in terms of alternate language or something sure. along those lines? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think I'd actually be hard pressed to really fig think of one that at least that I personally reviewed that didn't have some level of, you know, I think you should delete this section or I think that this is, this language is bad and you should replace it with this language or even if they didn't make a, a, a regulatory change suggestion, there would be a conceptual suggestion that was a pretty solid conceptual suggestion. Um, it, really there's not, there wasn't a whole lot of um, irrelevant or frivolous or any of that kind of, any word you'd want to use in that sort of range, uh, comments that were submitted. I think for the most part people who looked at this really took it very seriously and they submitted comments that were thoughtful and really drove at some of the issues that, um, that surround uh, this regulated community and this industry in Pennsylvania today. So it was really, um, like I said, from an eighth grade civics perspective, this was a great opportunity and I you know, feel an honor and a privilege to be able to work on these kind of issues um, to see the level of, of um, uh, you know, just the high level of, of commentary that was, that was being made in response to this proposed rulemaking. Now, the one thing I will say is we did get, <laughs> we got a lot of comments that were kind of outside the scope of this particular rulemaking. So we might get a comment that says, um, you know, in, bonding should be tripled. You, you should be requiring triple the bonds that you're requiring today for these, these wells. Well, 
the only thing that's in this rulemaking that relates to bonding is a change in the citation from the old section 215 of the Oil and Gas Act from 1984 to 3215 of, the, of Act 13. So this really wasn't a rulemaking that was, that was contemplating changes to the bonding provisions. It was just making a citation change. And so it, appeared in the, it appears in the proposed rulemaking, but it doesn't appear in a substantive sense of we're proposing changes to the bonding structure that the, that the legislature established. So uh, there, are some, there were some comments that were kind of outside the scope of the rulemaking, if you will, and I think that'll be reflected in the comment response document. We'll have a section that is, here's other comments that we got that just don't fit in, in the context of this rulemaking. And, and interestingly, some of them actually do fit in the context of the issues that we're going to talk about this afternoon relating to the subsurface activities piece of, the, of Chapter 78. So, so while they're maybe outside of the context of this rulemaking, maybe they're in, in the context of the broader program development that we're seeing in Pennsylvania. But for the most part, I've got to say it was really a, it was really a remarkably high level of, of discourse, frankly. Okay. So, so just in terms of some general comments that we received uh, across the board, um, the first one I mentioned already, extend the public comment period and schedule additional public hearings, uh, which, we, which we did. And in January of this year, the, the Environmental Quality Board and the department um, announced the extension of the public comment period and, and more public hearings scheduled. So that was one that we took care of, in a sense, in the, in the context of the actual public comment process. Um, the other two general comments that we received quite a bit were related to the conventional industry. And the first, excuse me, is um, there was some confusion, I think, in terms of what applied in the proposed rulemaking to the conventional industry, what applied to the unconventional industry, and what applied to both. And I think that that was a, um, a legacy of the structure that we tried to use here. So we didn't want to make wholesale changes to Chapter 78. So that, to the extent that we could work with the existing 78 structure, we didn't want to just throw it all out and start from scratch necessarily. So there are places in this rulemaking where I think uh, if you look at the reg closely, you'll see there's a subsection that appears to apply to both parts of the industry. Then maybe you'll see a subsection that's just unconventional then a conventional subsection, and then another subsection that applies to both again, and another subsection that applies to both. So in the, in the body of the regulation itself, there, there was, I think, there are opportunities there to, to make clarifications to make it clear, okay, this, this particular piece applies to everybody, and this particular piece only applies to the unconventional activities. Um, but, you know, the baseline comment there is, is more, just, there should just be two separate books. There should be a book that's a conventional book and a book for the unconventional book. So that's, that was one that we received in a, in a very general uh, way, in a very broad scope from, from many commentators, uh, frankly. A lot of folks, that was one of their, especially on the, the conventional side, there were, there were a lot of comments, but, but that was one that was pretty much almost any letter that came from a conventional interest side of the things, uh, that would be one of the comments, is give us a separate book. Um, the other one that we got there was a general comment which wasn't quite as broadly uh, spread across the common comment universe, but it was one that was a very general um, comment about the rulemaking itself was that the financial analysis that was done relating to conventional operations was either inaccurate or improper, uh, that, that we made bad assumptions when we, when we drafted the, the regulatory analysis form which talks about the costs and benefits of the regulation um, and that um, Therefore, our, we, we, we underestimated the impact of this rulemaking on the conventional oil and gas industry in Pennsylvania. So that was one that was very generally made. And, and it's probably a good point to mention at this point, you know, we're at a, we're at a point in the process right now where we're, we're still trying to get our arms around the comments that, we've, that were submitted. And, and, you know, it's a big job. And, and, and it's, an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting job because basically every piece of paper you pick up is somebody telling you what you did wrong. So this is where you missed the boat, DP. This is you, you went too far here. You didn't go far enough there. Or what you know? Uh, and, and for the most part, it was respectful, but occasionally it veered into, um, I, you know, I, I can't imagine how incompetent people like you are doing these jobs. So uh, it's <laughs> it's it's a really hard thing to get through. Frankly, it's it's something that uh, you know nobody likes to be told that they're doing their job badly and uh, this was basically page after page after page after page after page of that and I need to at this point um, step back and, and call out a member of my, my staff Ann Matthew who's sitting I think in the in the first row here she's really soldiered the, the, the bulk of the work of actually compiling these comments and stripping the comments out of the out of the, 
letters and, and emails that we've and documents that we've received. So, so I want to tip my cap to you, Anne. Uh, it's a you've done a, incredible work, and, and it's very much appreciated. But she can still smile. That's incredible. She can still laugh about it. Well, we're kind of through the now. We're, we're and that was the point was going to be that we're starting to move now into the consideration of the comments, the, the substantive consideration of the comments, and okay. How are we going to respond to this particular comment? And obviously, the, the financial analysis one is, is a big is a big question that we're going to have to wrestle with. Um, but you know, I just wanted to I wanted to point out that the, the great work that Anne had done to this point, and and to get us to the point where we can now sit down and start to start to work through the substance of the comments. Um, and this is one that obviously we're going to we're going to spend a lot of time and effort on um, and discussion with our, our industry partners on that one. Because we have to get it right, and if we don't get it right, then uh, then that doesn't serve anyone. So the the structure of the presentation, uh, in terms of the going through the comments received, is basically rather than try to say, well, this is the most important comment we received, and jump around in the regulation, we just felt like it would probably be better to just go through the regulation section by section. Um, I know it's a really boring way to do it, and and, and I hope everybody has uh, has has caffeined up this morning so that you can make it through this, but. But we did feel like this was probably the best approach just to make sure that we were comprehensive and we addressed everyone's issue. And, and the thinking behind the presentation here is, just so you understand, is, is that we try to take the most significant comments that we received. So this is not going to be something where we touch on every one of those thousands of comments in which, which we received on the rulemaking. It's either, it's kind of a combination of the most significant comments that we received in terms of the substance of the comments that we received or the most significant comments we received in terms of the uh, what I'll call maybe the weight of the comments received and what I mean by that is either the, uh, the just the sheer numbers of people who were saying these things or if the, we saw an issue where for example maybe on the conventional side we are hearing it from the entire industry so maybe there's fewer in terms of the raw number of comments that we received on the particular issue uh, it, we could see that it was broadly something that was a point that was shared across uh, across the, the group and so it made sense to include it here as part of uh, one of the ones that we called out so so the first piece here really is uh, is just definitions and we received a lot of comments about the definitions we received um, comments about definitions that were missing we received comments that, about definitions that were that re required clarification or expansion or modification and so these are the these are the significant comments that were um, they were included in the, in the side of the, okay, you've got a comment in the document, so you need to clarify, expand, or modify these definitions. And, and the list is there. I think um, one of them, um, conventional well, was actually addressed in the fee rulemaking, which went final and was published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin on, on J June 14th. Uh, we added a definition of conventional well to that rulemaking, which basically captures the, the, the act defined it in a negative way to say it's not any it's anything that's not unconventional and we felt uh, on the basis of a, of a comment from Pioga actually that um, we should probably spell it out because we spelled it out in the preamble so why not put it in the regulation as well and basically we ran through the categories there of all of the um, all of the, uh, the things that are excluded from the definition of unconventional uh, and, and put it in chapter 78 so that's part of the regulation today um, in terms of talking about Kurt, some of Kurt, yes. excuse me Gary, just a minute. Uh, before we go any further, uh, let, I'm trying to, to at least be uh, to clear my mind here um, as we go through these pages. Sure. If something's listed here, all you have done is identify where you have received comments or concerns. Uh, this does or doesn't represent issues that you will actually address. That's going to be based on the weighting that you you give these comments further well down. I, I mean we're obviously we're going to address all the issues i mean any comment that we receive we're required to provide a written response to so that's i mean we're going to go from start to finish in terms of the, even the smallest comment is going to get a response from the department okay. a written response um in terms of you know in terms of the process that we go through to make decisions about the comments that we, we've received. I mean, there isn't like a matrix that you can, or a formula that you can plug in and you can say, okay, we got 2,000 comments that said X, and they're from these people, and therefore we're gonna, we're gonna follow comment X and do, and make that change. Um, it's, you know, it's obviously, it's much more complex than that. It's something that we're gonna have to really sit down. And, and as, we, as you'll see as we go through these comments, 
the, the range of comments we got on these issues, I, I mean, it's, like I said, it's, I've never seen anything like it in my 21 years working for the for the department on any regulation. It is all the way from all the way over here to all the way over here, and every every point on the rainbow in between. And it just, uh, you know, we've got a lot of work to do ahead of us to try to try to wade through these comments and figure out. Okay, we, you know, we've got this huge range of comments uh, on an issue, and and I'll talk about it a little bit as we get into some of the substantive issues down the line here. Um, how do we? How do you weigh those comments? How do you judge which comment carries the most weight in terms of how you come to that final decision? And it's really going to have to be every time we go through on one of these issues, we're going to have to look at the comments that we got. Some of it's, I mean, some of it's going to be relatively straightforward in the sense of the information we got about the financial analysis impacts the conventional wells. So well, we need to do we need to do our homework on that. We need to go out and we need to figure out what the numbers actually look like, and we need to say, is this something that uh, you know, what benefit are we getting out of this change, and does that somehow outweigh the, the cost that we've now identified as a significant cost? Um, and every one of these issues is kind of the same way. We have to go through that process and weigh them. And, and you know, there's going to be a real resource challenge for us in the department, frankly, to get through these regulations because it is going to be a lot of work. Uh, and I think that's why we're uh, <laughs> a little bit We'll talk about the next steps when we get to the end of the presentation, sort of where we go from here now that we've got the, the comments. You know, we kind of got our arms wrapped around the comments now. Um, but it is it's somewhat uncertain in terms of the timeline because it is just going to be such a large effort to, to, okay. to dig through these comments. Um, some of the other ones to mention here, um, the, uh, the definition of mine influence water, we got a suggestion that the, that the um, including the surface waters, impaired by the pollution from mine drainage made the definition too broad, so we needed to narrow that definition. Um, oil and gas operations, we got some comments that we were improperly deviating from the act in that, in that definition and that the, as you read through the regulations, we use the term oil and gas operations in some places, we use the phrase oil and gas activities in some places, so that's something we need to, we just need to lock that down and get it cleaned up. Um, for regulated substance, the comments tended to go in the direction of that the definition was too broad and that the Act 2, uh, the definition is taken from the Land Recycling Act and uh, it was inappropriate for being for use in these in these regulations because what we did was globally we went through and we changed the, the phrase pollutional substance which is in the current Chapter 78 and replaced it with regulated substance and so some of the commentators felt that in the context of, a, of a remediation it's one thing in the context of for example requiring certain containment uh, practices to be used that perhaps it, it may be slightly too broad. Um, I think that's probably all to really mention on this, uh, on this slide. Uh, also in terms of definitions, we got some suggestions that we should uh, add definitions for certain things. Um, the first one there, approximate original contours, that of course is a restoration standard uh, phrase that's used and, and the the comments were that basically that the term was ambiguous and therefore unenforceable. Um, uh, to the extent practicable was a, was a problematic concept in that, uh, in that restoration piece as well. And that the, uh, the restoration wasn't re shouldn't be required to the extent, to the extent of, of approximate original contours uh, and that it's not appropriate under Act 13 to require that. So that's a, that's a comment. And basically the idea there would be we would define the term and, and narrow its focus um, to address those concerns. Freshwater was another con comment that we got a lot of, uh, or another definition we got a lot of comments on, suggesting we needed a definition for it because, of course, there are different requirements for freshwater impoundments versus, versus centralized impoundments. Um, and so the uh, Folks just felt that we needed to put some boundaries around what fresh water actually meant, and so we sh the definition would be appropriate to to deal with that. And the uh, one of the other driving points on fresh water was that the concept in the reg proposed rulemaking is that mine influence water of a certain quality would be allowed to be stored in a freshwater impoundment rather than a wastewater impoundment, um, and that that was inappropriate. So that was sort of the driver on that on that comment as well. And then for occupied dwelling, um, I think we've all sort of implemented that provision, and so I think we all have an idea of what that what an occupied dwelling actually means. But 
the idea here was that perhaps we should define that term to make it explicit in terms of the setbacks for the uh, for permitting, uh, exactly where the, those boundaries would be drawn and what types of structures would be included in the, in the dwelling setback. Okay, so that was all. That was really the high level stuff that we that we got for definitions. Um, and so then we move into. Uh, <laughs> Again, like I said, we, we didn't do this in any order uh, based on the, the amount of comments we got or the, or the, the type of uh, the weight of the comments that we received. But obviously, the changes to Section 7815 received an enormous amount of interest, both, uh, you know, again, across the spectrum of, uh, of commentators from individual citizens and, and environmental groups through the industry uh, and operators themselves. So um, these are these these. The comments that are on this slide really drive more at some of the uh, some of the process concerns here. Um, that the, the permit applicant should be the one who d determines whether the activity would affect the threatened or endangered species, not the department. It's one comment we received, and also that um, if there's a comment, I'm sorry, a permit that may impact a public resource, that the department should should prepare a written comment and response document. So, for example. Um, is the way the proposed rulemaking was structured? There would be there would be a reach out from the from the applicant to, to the jurisdictional agency that was responsible for managing the particular public resource in question, and uh, try to work out with them what uh, what the, any probable harmful impacts might be. And so, if we got a comment back from a, let's say a county that had a county park or DCNR or one of the other resource agencies, that the department should be required to respond in writing to those comments rather than simply not condition the permit or condition the permit at the end of the day. The, uh, in terms of the substantive comments that we got uh, on 7815, um, the first one there really is uh, shorthand for a large portion of the comments that we received substantively on this particular provision. And the idea here is that uh, the term critical community as it's used in the Oil and Gas Act <laughs> does not mean special concern species and the two shouldn't be equated as they are in the proposed regulations. Um, I don't know that there's a huge amount to say about this issue. I think it's been pretty well um, discussed in depth to some degree. Uh, obviously, it's something that we knew going into this proposed rulemaking was a concern for uh, especially the in industry folks. It's going to have to be something that we sit down and consider working with our resource agency partners to try to figure out. Uh, is this something that, that we feel is, is appropriate to, to move forward with or not? Uh, but I will say that the, that the um, I, I think as much as anything else, the issues that we're seeing with, re with regard to this particular topic relate more to, less to the proposed rulemaking and more to how these species of special concern are identified and how they're developed. Um, one of the things we've been working with our, our resource agency partners on is just to try to get a sense of, okay, Game Commission, how do you go about putting something on a special concern species list? What's the process? Um, where's your list? Give us that information so that we can then communicate that out to the, to the regulated community about, okay, what exactly is going to be covered or not covered by this particular provision? Um, and, and so I think there's work to be done outside of the context of this rulemaking um, that will inform this, this, this rulemaking as we move from proposed to final. Uh, but it's, it's obviously an issue that has been identified with great um, uh, force, I will say, with great um, emphasis from the industry commentators that, that submitted comments on this particular issue. So it's something we've certainly heard and we understand is, 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 is causing a great deal of concern uh, outside of, uh, outside of the, the department. So it is one that we will be wrestling with as we move from proposed to final. In terms of the public resource protection um, provisions, we also re received comments which suggested that, that the setbacks, and, and the, this actually comes out of the comment, the term setbacks is used, and it's really not a setback. It's more, of a, it's more of a trigger, if you will, a proximity trigger that says you have to look at these things if you're within a certain distance of this particular resource. Um, the suggestion in the comments was that where we set, where we drew those lines was inappropriate, and they should actually be drawn farther out from the resource. Um, so that's why it's the, the, the bullet there is increase the setbacks. Um, it, you know, it's, again, it's not really a setback. It's more of a question of where, when a permit re condition review would be triggered, and the idea there is that that, that should, those boundaries should be expanded. 
And then there was also the, um, uh, the comment that we should basically, the, the regulation should basically outright ban drilling on state or federal lands. Um, you know, I, I think that comment kind of speaks for itself and there's, there's really not a whole lot more to say about that one. Um, certainly the way that the proposed rulemaking is structured, if there was proposed to be a well on a, in a state forest or in a state park, this public resource permit conditioning process would be triggered, just like it would be as if you were proximate to those resources. So I think the way we decided to structure the program was rather than have the outright ban in the regulations, it would be something where we would have additional, um, additional review and additional consideration for how the development would potentially impact those proposed, uh, those public resources. Um, some of the other comments we got on 7815, uh, we heard loud and clear that there ought to be regulatory criteria for conditioning a permit directly spelled out in the regulations themselves as opposed to um, maybe being something that would be subject to a technical guidance document or an SO standard operating procedures kind of a document, something like that outside of the context of the rulemaking. And the idea here is that uh, if the permit condition that we were going to be put into place was going to be so onerous as to basically uh, eliminate the use of that particular site as a, uh, as a particular possible well location or otherwise would be so just so burdensome on that development as to make it economically uh, infeasible that there, we should spell out where those lines are drawn in the regulation because the act does say that, that we have to uh, consider some of these issues and uh, the comment was that it should be just spelled out in the reg as well. Um, in terms of in terms of 7815C, there was a request for clarification regarding what has to be provided regarding parent and subsidiary business entities. And this, of course, is there's a there was language added to Act 13, which allows us to potentially block permits for compliance issues of subsidiary or parent business entities that are connected with the permit applicants. And um, the idea here was just to provide some clarification in the regulation about what exactly the scope of that of that that compliance review would be and what information needed to be submitted to the department and when. And then the last bullet there, um, we received a lot of comments, uh, of course, with the December 19th, 2013 Robinson Township decision. Uh, there was a lot of commentary about the continuing authority for this, this rulemaking to, to contain a, a provision that relates to public resources impacts permitting conditioning. Uh, so that's something that obviously we have to we have to wrestle with in terms of whether or not that stays in the regulation or not moving forward. Um, I think the only thing to say about that is probably is that it's an issue that we're looking at with with great interest and in, very closely, and and I think that that's something that will um, we haven't made any decisions yet about about what the final rulemaking looks like, obviously on this piece, and it's something that we have to give a great deal of, of deep thought to. So moving out of the permitting sections, um, the next section that's covered is uh, section 7851. And this, of course, is the, the drinking water supply replacement uh, when at post impact by drilling uh, provisions. This is the, the language in the, in the act that was changed to say that for water supplies that exceeded the drinking water standards, um, they needed to be replaced uh, at a particular level. And obviously this is one of the four issues that we identified last year and were part of the subcommittee discussions last year in, in Greensburg and State College. So I don't think there's any surprises here with the range of comments we received on this particular issue is, but we did want to point it out because this was a significant area of commentary. Um, I don't know if we received any comments that didn't touch on this issue. I mean, probably somewhere in those 24,000, there were a few that didn't raise this, but for the most part, this was one of the issues that the environmental groups identified in their, in their form letters and most of the individual commentators who, who went through and commented on uh, most of the provisions included as well. And, and, and the range of the comments are about what you would, what, what you would expect to be. Um, you know, on the one side, we have the idea that if the water quality was better than safe drinking water standards pre-drill, it should be restored to that higher standard. And that if the, uh, if it was worse than drinking water standards pre-drill, that it should be returned to the safe drinking water standards. Uh, the, um, one of the interesting points in the continuum that we received in the comments was that, okay, so if it was better, we'll replace it if it's better, but if it was worse, we should be able to meet the worst quality that was in place before, un worse than safe drinking water standards. So if, you're, if the water didn't meet safe drinking water standards before the drilling occurred, 
even if there's an impact to the to the water, it should only it should be re restored to the position it was in before the drilling occurred. Whether that was better, worse, equivalent, it doesn't matter. Um, and that was actually one that I, I, when I saw that comment, I thought, well, that's one that I don't think I've heard before. So that was that was a very interesting one, as well. Um, and then the the other side of it basically was is is something similar to that, which is um, that if uh, and 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 this what what I think this comment is driving at is more along the lines of. Uh, there are concerns with, with drinking water supplies from groundwater and private water wells in Pennsylvania, putting aside anything to do with drilling. Um, the well construction standards are not in place, and so in many places there is the drinking water is substandard before an operator shows up in the area and drills a single well. And so I think what this comment is driving at is that the industry shouldn't have to fix that bad water because they just happen to be in the neighborhood. Uh, the water was bad before they got there, and, and it shouldn't be their obligation to raise the drinking water levels up uh, if they had nothing to do with, with causing an impact to the drinking water. So, so again, I think that's one where we had a pretty clear idea walking into the rulemaking where the, where the commentary was going to end up, and, and I don't think there were many surprises there with the exception of the one that I mentioned regarding... Um, you know, whatever it was before is what it should be after an impact occurs. The next section is 7852, and this is the this is the pre-drilling or pre-alteration survey section, um, the abandoned and orphan well section. And again, this was this was another one of the four um, that was was captured in the four issues that we talked about last year in the in the water supply replacement issue. And this is an interesting one because there's um, there's a number of points to be made here, I think, and we got this actually from both sides. We got it from the industry side and we got it from the environmental group side, which was that there should be a consistent and comprehensive list of per parameters to, to sample for as part of a pre-drill water survey. So give us the list. Tell us these are the things we want you to look for, uh, industry. The, the citizens and the environmental groups will know that that's what, that's what the industry is looking for when they come out to do the, the pre-drilling survey. Um, and that just to have it be out there in black and white. Now, of course, we have... We have we've provided some educational documents about what we believe should be part of a pre-drill survey. Um, this is an interesting one because the, the act itself sets up a, a legal structure which is kind of different from most other states that we talk to about how they handle these issues. In most other states, typically what would happen would be there would be a survey that's required. It's just you have to do it. You have to do it out to a certain distance. You have to sample for these particular things. Um, and you have to report the results to the agency that you, that you find them, what you find. In Pennsylvania, of course, we have a presumption of liability provision. So the operator could go out and they could not take a single sample if they didn't want, if they, they felt like rolling the dice that day, uh, there's a lot of public water in the area or something like that. Uh, they don't, they don't, they're not obligated to take a single sample under our act. There is a great deal of risk involved with that, and I would not suggest um, that anybody doesn't take a water sample. Obviously, I think for, it's a, just a best practice. In fact, I think probably most folks should take samples outside of the boundaries of the 2,500-foot circle that's established uh, under the Act. But, but the, the law is what it is. And so, um, you know, it's one of those issues where because the law is structured in a particular way, we structured our regulation in a particular way as well. So uh, it's one we're going to have to take back and we're going to have to take a look at the Act again and, and try to figure out if this is the kind of thing that we feel comfortable with. Um, putting in a regulation, uh, putting it in a guidance document or a statement of policy is, a, is an entirely different matter. I think that may be something, that may be the path that we would, we would walk down um, when we get to the, the final rulemaking on this question. But again, it's something that we do have to consider and, as we move forward. The other piece is that um, we got a lot of commentary about making the, the data, pre drill data available online. Um, you know, it's one of those things that we understand is something that needs to be done. It's the, the tricky part here is maintaining the homeowner's privacy in terms of the sample was taken from this residence on this such and such a date, and this is what we found. And, we, you know, when we do get right to no requests for this information or otherwise make this information available to the public, we do try to maintain that, that uh, privacy interest as we do so. So it's something that we're certainly working towards, and I would expect that... Um, well, it's not something that I don't think is going to be included in the regulation itself. It is uh, a significant comment that we receive as part of the rulemaking process. And it's, and it's something, frankly, that's a goal for us. It is something we are attempting to do. 
Moving on, um, the next section is 7852A, and this is the abandoned and orphan well identification piece. Um, this is, the, again, another one of the major issues that we talked about in Greensburg and State College last year. Um, and the comments that we received on this issue, again, this was another one where, gosh, the, this, the continuum of comments we received on this were, was really breathtaking. It was one of those things where um, you, you almost were surprised that people were talking about the same regulation when you looked at some of these comments because they were so divergent in terms of this person commenting about this over here and this person commenting on the same thing over here. And you looked at them and you said, I, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that these people read the same regulations and made the same commentary. And some of the, some of the high level um, sort of categories of comments we got are captured here on this slide uh, in the bullets. So, so the type and the scope of investigation that would be required. Um, scope meaning basically, okay, uh, how far out do you have to go from these, from the vertical wellbore and the horizontal wellbore? Is it going to be something where we're going to draw a circle around the horizontal lateral and say only wells that penetrate within a certain distance of the of the wellbore, given the fracture propagations, that's all we're going to need you to be concerned about? Um, or is it going to be everything is measured from the surface? Uh, the one comment we got was um, that, the, that the survey area should be the effective fracture propagation from the planned stimulation activities plus 4,000 feet. So assuming your frac job is going to get you maybe seven, 800 feet out of the horizontal lateral, they wanted the, the survey to be done as measured from the horizontal lateral itself at the surface of all wells, 4,800 feet off of, that, off of that horizontal lateral. So you can imagine what that looks like on a, on a map as you, as you place it out there. So 4,000 feet up from the vertical wellbore and then 44,000 plus the fracture propagation from the horizontal lateral, I mean, the survey area would be massive. So, you know, in terms of the scope, it's, we had a very wide range of commentary about what that scope should look like. And in terms of the type of investigation, we also had a very wide range of commentary from, you know, I should be able to look at the department's database and whatever I find there is all I need to do to you need to go out with a magnometer and walk the land and do flyovers and all these things. Uh, you know, a survey is not enough. Knocking on a landowner's door is not enough, but, but the operator should actually be walking the property to determine where those wells, uh, abandoned orphan wells actually are. Uh, the second big category was the timing of the investigation. And, and this is one where we really got mostly comments on one side. And the commentary there was that rather, as the proposed rulemaking, states that the, it has to be done prior to stimulation activities occurring. The comments we got in this category really were driving it. It should be done before the permit is even issued. So before the, like, like, like the notification occurs before the permit application comes in, this survey should also occur before the application comes in as well and, be, and the, the results of the survey be submitted with the permit so that the department can properly condition the permit if we have things that we're concerned about as a result of the, of the survey. The third category there is uh, the post-investigation action levels. And basically what this means, what this captures is the idea of um, what do you need to do so you've identified these wells that, that may pose some risk uh, given the, the stimulation package that you're going to employ. Um, what do, you, do, you, do you monitor them visually? Are you required to place electronic monitors on them? All the way up to um, that the department should determine whether or not there are responsible operators for these wells. Uh, and if not, that the operator in, who's proposing to drill the new well should be required to plug those abandoned orphan wells. Um, and then also, if, if, if there is an impact, uh, what actually happens as a result of that? And, that? and what actually happens as a result of that range from the operator should have no liability if the landowner refused access, all the way through the, the operator is 100% liable for altering the well, quote unquote, and needs to address any remedial action and plugging action that needs to take place as a result of the communication between the new well and the abandoned well. So this is one, again, where, um, you know, there's a really broad range of comments on a number of these topics, and we're going to really have to take these comments back and try to figure out, you know, what makes the most sense in terms of the risks that we're trying to address here. Um, uh, because there are some risks, but maybe they're not as, as, as broadly stated as, as some of the comments would, would suggest. The last one there, uh, I think, is, is, is not a very controversial one, but it, that it's, um, the comment was just that we sh there should be something in the regulation which requires the department to make the wells that are identified as part of these surveys um, be mapped as part of a publicly available web, web platform. And I think that certainly, again, is our goal as we get this information in. We would 
want to update our oil and gas abandoned orphan well database, uh, which you can currently access online, which has about somewhere south of 10,000 wells identified where the EP inspector has actually walked on a piece of property and said there is an abandoned orphan well here, uh, as opposed to looking at a map or, or something like that. So that's uh, abandoned orphan well surveys. The next section, and again, a number, uh, I, I don't know if this was number one comment that we received, but it was probably somewhere near the top in terms of the raw numbers. Um, but the, this idea of uh, the banning of open pit storage for regulated substance storing all stages of oil and gas activities. So the way that the regulation is structured now, we have a temporary storage section, which is while the well is being drilled, um, excuse me, before it's completed and put into production. And then there's a production storage section that, that deals with the longer term storage of produced waters that may need to occur so that you've got one thing that's on the site for a relatively limited period of time and then you've got a second thing that's on the site potentially for decades. Um, the, 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 the point of these comments was that it shouldn't matter what part of the process you're in, whether it's temporary or long term, uh, open, open top storage, open pit storage should be banned. Um, I don't know that there's much more to say about the comment than that. I mean, that was pretty much where the comments came out. Uh, on this particular comment, there was a range from just ban it, and that was, that was the single comment and no supporting information, all the way through comments that we received, which, which made environmental protection type arguments about why the banning, sh why these things should be banned. And, and it's um, really, it was more, I think some of the concepts Concerns about leakage, if you have a pit, it's, it's much more difficult to determine if you have a problem than if you have a, a tank structure that can be in secondary containment above the ground. And there were also some interesting concerns raised about air quality issues um, that we'll need to probably access the expertise on from our air quality program to try to address appropriately. Um, but that, I mean, that's a, that's a big one. That's one that, that we heard from a lot of people about, and uh, we're going to certainly have to go back and take a look at... Um, at that in terms of uh, temporary storage and also in terms of, um, of uh, longer term storage as well. And that's a, it's, there's a similar bullet when we get to the long term storage slide about uh, this, this exact issue. Um, the second area on temporary storage that we received a lot, a lot of comments on was that we should clarify the design approval process um, for the modular above ground storage facilities, that that should be something that um, uh, just basically there be, should be some more in the regulation that talks about what that process looks like and, um, and how we're going to go through reviewing and approving these, uh, these modular above ground storage facilities. The, the third bullet kind of gets to, goes back to the first bullet to some degree that uh, we should be requiring closed loop fluid management systems at well sites rather than simply leaving it up to the best practice of the operator um, or the choice of the operator whether to use a, a pit uh, system versus a closed loop system. And then uh, we got a comment, specific comment regarding uh, liner thickness, and that it should vary depending on the depending on the depth of the pit. Um, we also got some other commentary of, uh, on the on liners about whether or not liner thickness is actually an appropriate standard that we should be uh, that that should be the test and not something like like puncture resistance and those kind of things that maybe might be a more appropriate test than than simply saying it's so many millimeters thick. Um, so those, some some interesting technical technical commentary there. Oh. There we go. Okay. A few other comments about tech, temporary storage that we received. Um, pit liner certification should be required so that the uh, the liner should should have to go through a process uh, for installation that uh, results in some sort of certified statement about how it was installed and, and uh, that the design was adequate and that the as installed uh, liner placement was acceptable as well. Um, a lot of comments about whether or not uh, the liner should be required to cover freeboard and that, uh, that, that they should be and that should be explicit in the regulation. And then the last comment about temporary storage which we heard a lot from the conventional industry was that the uh, the, the, the pit side slope requirements, the two to one slope requirements would unnecessarily result in larger site disturbances because the, when you think about the, the two to one slope, it's going to require much larger pits. Um, and that those, those pits, because they'd be larger, would actually result in much increased costs without any concomitant um, environmental benefit. So there was really nothing to, to, 
the, the cost benefit in that, in that situation was out of whack, both from an environmental perspective in, in terms of the increased site disturbance and also from the cost. So 7857, as I noted, um, the way we structured the proposed rulemaking is there's a temporary storage while, while activities are occurring at the well site to develop the wells. Uh, and then there's a second section that talks about um, control and disposal of production fluids. And again, this is one that where there's ec echoed that um, the, the idea of the pits being allowed for, uh, uh, that they should be allowed on some of these sites or that they shouldn't be allowed on some of these sites so that we got uh, a fair amount of commentary on allowing them going into the future. Um, again, the, the, first, the first line there into the first bullet the, is the concept that, that we should be banning these structures altogether, whether you're talking about uh, storage of this production fluids or the temporary storage of flowback as, as well as are being developed. Um, interesting question about uh, subsection A that the uh, could be interpreted to exclude the use of centralized impoundments so that we needed to clarify the intent of the subsection relating to centralized impoundments because obviously as you get deeper into the into the proposed rulemaking centralized impoundments are are allowed and they are they are certainly something that uh, we now have detailed regulations for as part of the proposed rulemaking and so just a need for clarity here to make it clear that the 7857 and, and the later sections um, don't conflict and that, that centralized impoundments would certainly still be allowed to be used for um, proper, really it's recycling of, of flowback water uh, for the most part is, is why centralized impoundments are going to be used. Um, the, other, the other piece here that we received a lot of comments about, and this is again on the conventional side of things, um, I would say it's another one of these areas where almost every commentator that submitted a comment from the conventional side of the industry included some, some comment along these lines, and that is that um, the replacement of the burial, buried or partially buried tanks storing production fluids was unnecessary from an environmental perspective, extremely expensive from a cost perspective, and also I think um, another piece that we received a lot of comment on was that given the nature of these operations, in fact it's something that that from an operational perspective makes a lot of sense because you can gravity feed these tanks because they're buried you don't have to worry about um, concerns with freezing in, in, in some of our uh, you know like last winter um, and so from an operational perspective there are operational reasons why these tanks are appropriate at these sites and so I think well it, that's an area where I think we're going to have to do some work to um, to figure out exactly what the final rulemaking looks like on this question because some very interesting issues were raised and I think um, we'll have to certainly address those as we go forward. The next section is um, 7858. This is on-site processing. Um, this is the regulation that talks about um, how waste waters primarily but are, are handled on site. Of course, the Solid Waste Management Act requirements in terms of permitting and bonding do not apply for any on-site waste processing. And so we felt it was important to have a, a regulatory section that addressed these issues head on. Um, and you know, the first bullet there I think is kind of a no-brainer, but it's, it's something that, that we need to make sure that we're working into these concepts as we go to final. And that's, did, are, the, are the requirements that we're putting into place, are they encouraging the reuse and recycling of uh, the fluids and waste at the well sites? Because obviously, um, in Pennsylvania, we don't have an underground injection disposal capacity that's going to allow people to put these waters on a truck and take it, take it to a, an injection well and dispose of the water that way. So we need to make sure that to the extent possible we can have a pro regulatory program which, which provides the necessary environmental protection and the necessary um, information gathering, but that, that as much as possible, you know, the process gets out of the way of encouraging the recycling and reuse of these fluids. To, to the greatest extent uh, possible. Um, so that was one sort of aspect of these comments. And then again, as I noted, we get the, uh, you get the full spectrum uh, approach on most of these issues. Um, and and this, is, this, this one is certainly um, not an exception to that. When, and so we got a comments that basically this should be a prohibited practice. Uh, there should not be on-site processing of any of these um, substances related to the oil and gas operations. Um, uh, you know, the comment goes on there to talk about hazardous substances and radioactive materials and therefore require thorough analysis and special handling. And, and um, uh, you know, again, it's a comment that, that we take at face value and we'll consider carefully. Uh, I think 
I think if, if you look at the proposed rulemaking, the department obviously feels that we have regulations and practices in place that can allow for the very safe um, and uh, environmentally protective handling on, on well sites of these materials today, and that the, the regulations as they move forward will also include those uh, protections. But uh, the comment is taken for what it, for what it is, and, uh, and we'll have to respond to that appropriately, I think. So the next, the next three sections all address impoundments. And so the next three sections are impoundment, embankments, um, centralized impoundments for the storage of wastewater and freshwater impoundments, which is a new, a new uh, concept that's new to this proposed rulemaking. And so the first, the first comment there relates to the, the storage of mine influenced water. And I touched on this in the definition section a little bit earlier. And basically the, the, the concept here was that um, there should not be allowed any storage of mine influenced water and freshwater impoundments. So that was the, that's the driver on that comment there. If it's, if it's mine influenced water, it should be considered akin to a waste product and therefore should be stored in a centralized impoundment uh, or a waste management facility only. Um, again, I, I, you know, I, comments we're just providing them. This, these are the comments we received so you can hear what, to, what we're going to have to be responding to. Um, the, uh, the second big concept there was that the 100 foot setback for blue line stream should be extended to all water bodies. It shouldn't be a blue line stream limit only. Um, and the third uh, bullet point there in terms of the impoundment regulations was that um, there shouldn't be separate regulations for freshwater impoundments for oil and gas operators than there should be for anybody else in Pennsylvania. And, and to be fair, uh, in terms of this comment, this, this will place additional regulation on the oil and gas industry that is not currently in place for other, for other operations. I mean, there's, there's no two ways about that. Um, and so that comment is taken, uh, again, at face value for what it's worth and that, and it's, we will certainly be acknowledging that this is something that where we've called out this industry for, for special consideration. Um, in terms of impoundments, we received a lot of, um, a lot of comments about the leak detection system. And these are primarily from the environmental group side of the fence. Um, and they related mostly to uh, putting, allowing water to be placed back into the impoundment that, that a, a leak was detected from. Uh, obviously, some folks thought, thought that that was a bad idea. And there were also some concerns raised about some of the leak rates that are included in the, uh, in the regulation, some allowable leak rates, which, which um, it, you know, it's part of the regulation. It's there because we felt that it was important to address issues with regard to um, seepage and condensation and all that sort of stuff, that there would be some allowable amount of, of water to be detected through the leak detection system without triggering corrective action, uh, we felt that that was an appropriate concept to include in the proposed rulemaking, and now we'll take another look at it based on the commentary we received on this issue um, uh, as part of the public comment period. There were, we also received negative comment about uh, the concept in the, in the, in the regulation, proposed regulation that allows the use of natural springs instead of monitoring wells that are located downgrading of centralized impoundments as that being uh, an inappropriate um, sort of monitoring tool that natural springs should be protected and that additional monitoring wells should be, should be put into place so as to determine before the contamination reaches that natural spring that, uh, that the operator is given fair warning of that before they get to the point of having to actually clean that up. And then um, another comment about the um, occupied dwellings, the 500 foot setback was not adequate and it needed to be um, expanded. And I think what this gets to is, um, excuse me, a comment that um, in the waste regulations, they, they have setbacks from the, from, the, from the waste that's being stored, so the, the impoundment itself, and also from the toe of the, uh, the fill point. So there are actually two setbacks, so much distance from, from the embankment that's been created and so much distance from the waste itself. And so in situations where you're not actually filling on one side, you just probably measure from the, from the, the actual uh, point of waste disposal or waste storage. Um, but on a fill side, obviously, you could take up some of that, that 500 feet with the, with the constructed facility. And in some cases, I think the concern is that, that that piece of the structure will be getting too close to occupied dwellings and there needs to be an additional setback there. So that's one again that we'll probably look at with our, with relation to our waste management counterparts to try to figure out what the, what the proper um, setbacks for impoundments need to look like. So a few more comments um, on impoundments. Um, 
got a com comment about the uh, about the oversight of the installation of the liner for impoundments and the need for a supervision by a representative of the manufacturer uh, and, and the need to follow the, the DEP approved quality, quality assurance quality control plan. Basically that that would be unnecessary if there were competent personnel who were, who were operating uh, or, or constructing these facilities that, uh, that that would be an unnecessary step and an additional burden on the process and, and should be removed from the regulation. Um, the second bullet on this slide, I mean, I think it's back to the concept that, um, you know, open air storage of wastewater is inappropriate and should be prohibited. Um, excuse me. Um, so again, it's again, following on that theme, um, you know, you've got the potential for pits for, for, for flowback. You've got a potential pit for pits for produced water and a potential for pits, you know, on a larger scale as a centralized wastewater impoundment and all that should be banned. Um, there's, Nothing really that hasn't already been discussed this morning to say about that piece, I don't think. Um, and then this one was an interesting one, this last one, um, <clears throat> that, the, that the design standards shouldn't actually be inclu included in the regulations, that they're actually too prescriptive. And, and the more appropriate form for this, these type of standards would be to have a performance standard in the regulation and then have a detailed design standard document, um, like kind of like the BMP manual for, for erosion and sediment control or something along those lines, that there should be a guidance manual that, that lays out these, uh, these more detailed types of, types of standards and that all we need in the regulations is, a, is a, say you can do this and here's the performance standard and then we'll fill in the details uh, in, the, in the regulation, I'm sorry, in the guidance document. And you know, it's a fair comment. I think that the, when you look at that portion of the regulation, it is a very detailed portion of the regulation. It, it um, for the most part, is taken directly from our existing uh, centralized impoundment permit program. And so it is something that uh, certainly we'll take a look at as to whether or not this is the appropriate vehicle for these type of, uh, these type of requirements. And, that, and that's the kind of comment that we get a lot, DEP, those kind of comments about what's the proper vehicle for, for putting certain standards in place. Is it a regulation or is it uh, is guidance document policy, statements of policy enough? So the next three sections, uh, four sections deal with disposal and discharge of, of waste materials at well sites. And, I, you know, this is one that I think generated a great deal of interest, this, this concept generally. I mean, again, it was one of the, the four major topic areas that we talked about last year in the subcommittee meetings. And so, no surprise, we got a lot of, a lot of commentary on, on the requirements that, that were in the regulations. And basically, a lot of the um, comments from the environmental groups and from citizens were along the lines of, what's represented on this slide, which is basically that um, it should be banned. Ban lab, land application of residual waste. Um, on well sites, uh, ban the, the burial or land application of drill cuttings. Um, you know, I, I, again, it's, it's a pretty straightforward comment. It's something that we're going to have to consider. Uh, obviously, the proposed rulemaking didn't include anything like an outright ban, or rather, it, it, the proposed rulemaking acknowledged that under certain circumstances this could be an appropriate way of addressing the, um, uh, these wastes on these well sites. And as long as those regulations are being followed, then, then th from our perspective, that's an appropriate environmental protection approach to the issue of waste management <coughs> on well sites. Again, we'll have to take this one back and, and try to figure out if, if maybe we've missed the boat on that one. Um, the next bullet here. Um, the, the, and this was an interesting one taking it in the other direction. So um, in some portions of this, of this part of the regulation, we basically ban the disposal of waste from unconventional wells um, on, the, uh, on these well sites. And, it's, and that is a blanket prohibition. And so we were challenged um, really from the industry side about, okay, so, so show, us your, show us the information which suggests to you that, that, that if we do these things in, these, in the manner that, that we're required to by regulation, that somehow, um, you know, a legally, but b from a scientific perspective, that uh, that this blanket prohibition can be can be justified. So, you know, on the one hand, we said there's blanket. You should have a blanket prohibition for all wastes at these well sites, not just the unconventional uh, waste. And then on the other side, we've got commentary that um, that the, the to the extent that it is banned, it's not supported by on a le either legally or from a scientific basis and the department's gonna to need to go back and do our homework on this one to make sure that we can justify this. And, and you know, again, like on any of these issues, if we find that we're in a situation where we feel, you know what, maybe we missed the boat on that one, whether it's the direction of 
you know, we should have banned everything or we should have allowed for this to occur under a particular set of circumstances, I think we'll, we'll certainly be open to making those changes um, uh, at the end of the day once we've gone through the, the process of sort of grinding through the, the, the comments and, and coming up with responses to them. Last one uh, there is uh, on this slide, it relates to the, uh, the testing for radioactivity. Um, I think the only thing to say about that one is that the, um, the, uh, the TNORM study is certainly ongoing right now. Our Bureau of Radiation Protection has been out to many well sites uh, to test these materials and landfills to test these materials. And I think depending on what they come back with, uh, we'll see amendments to this portion of this rulemaking uh, as well based on, on the scientific evidence that they're able to uncover. And, you know, it's, it's something to be said, uh, I think, just as a little bit of background in terms of how these regulations were developed, one of the things that we did talk about was a banning of disposal of drill cuttings from the horizontal portion of the of these of these uh, unconventional wells. And we did a study, the Oil Office of Oil and Gas Management did a drill cutting study, and we felt like it couldn't be justified. I mean, we, we took that out before we even got to the proposed rulemaking stage of publication in the Pennsylvania Bulletin because we felt like when we took a hard look at, at what these materials contain, yeah, there's going to be a lot more of them because you're in a relatively uh, homogeneous formation, and so the volume of this particular kind of drill cutting is going to be increased over what you might see in the vertical portion of a well, because then you're going through different sandstones and shales and limestones, and so it's more heterogeneous, and you've got a little bit of a lot of different things. Um, our concern was that you're going to have large volumes of this one kind of thing, and that may cause certain concerns. So we, we went out and we did, we took samples and we studied the issue, and we determined that we didn't feel that we could justify that ban. Uh, is moving forward on proposed. So it is something that we're, we're going to take very seriously. We're going to take, go back and take a look at and figure out, you know, where the, where the right place is in terms, of, in terms of the impact, the environmental impact, in terms of the requirements that we place on operators and in terms of the environmental protection necessary at the end of the day. So this is a, this is a very wordy slide, but it can basically be boiled down to the fact that, um, that the waste materials should be sampled at the well site to determine that they have not been contaminated and that they meet regulatory standards prior to disposal. Um, I think this gets at some of the concerns that maybe some of these materials are being shipped off of well sites um, based on some of the characteristics that are understood to be in place for some of these materials. So, so we're not requiring necessarily sampling of every load that comes off of the site. Uh, and the comment here is that we should be requiring that prior to the, prior to the waste either being disposed of on the site or, um, or being sent off site for, for disposal or treatment. Uh, again, you know, uh, this is an interesting comment that we received. Um, the, of course, there's, a, there's an exemption under, the, under RICRA sub, subpart C for um, oil and gas waste from the definition of hazardous waste, which Pennsylvania has adopted, incorporated by reference. And, the gist of this comment is that RICRA allows states to be more, to be more uh, stringent if we choose to be, so therefore we should reject the EPA, um, uh, <laughs> EPA definitional exemption for these materials from the definition of hazardous waste, and we should be applying hazardous waste standards basically to any storage in pit centralized impoundments, tanks, uh, storage transport and use. Um, I don't know if there's much to say about that this morning. Um, I think uh, my, my colleagues in the residual waste program uh, probably feel pretty good about, about the regulation in Pennsylvania as it stands today. So, um, but it was a comment that we received that we should, we should go beyond the boundaries of what, what um, EPA allows uh, and required. And then the last piece about um, sort of the on-site disposal and discharge requirements is that we should require long-term groundwater monitoring and financial assurance for all on-site waste disposal areas. And, Again, this is driving at the, the waste management requirements on a well site versus if you are take, sending it to a residual waste landfill um, or land application requirements for residual waste, which typically have closure and post-closure requirements, which are a very long tail of, of monitoring requirements that are required to be in place for these materials. And again, we're going to go back. It's obviously not something that we included in the proposed rulemaking, but we will take a look at that and we will respond appropriately to, that, to those comments. So the next sections uh, address containment requirements under the new regulations. Um, the first comment that we received there um, is that the requirements should be 
should be strengthened. Um, the containment around oil and condensate tanks, we should have um, much more robust um, containment standards than what we included in the proposed rulemaking. Uh, the second comment we received on this uh, the, sort of the broad area of comments was that the um, the materials that were included in the in the proposed rulemaking actually went outside the boundaries of what's included in the 2012 Oil and Gas Act, and there are six particular kinds of materials listed there. And I, I think this also um, drives back to the the question of the definition of regulated substance, which we use uh, in this section. It used to say pollutional substances, and so we again we made that global change. And so I think the thinking is that by using that term here for containment requirements, we've actually expanded the scope beyond what the, what the statute required, and so we've exceeded the statutory authority there somewhat. Um, the, the third comment there was, the, uh, was for clarification. Um, and basically, this is the idea that whether the secondary containment requirements that are outlined in 7864 subsection F need to meet the, the containment standards that are expressed in subsection E of that section, uh, which talk about a little, go into a little more detail about what containment needs to look like um, it's a little bit unclear as to whether or not the secondary containment piece of that section refers back to the E and, and takes those standards, or if it's if it's something that the two stand completely apart and um, and they again uh, don't have the same standards. And we just need to clarify that question. Uh, also, on this same point, um, there's uh, we got comments that suggested that we were again ex expanding the scope of what was covered by the Act. And so that the statutory authority was being somewhat stretched here uh, in this regulation, and, and we needed to make go back and take another look and see sort of where the, the boundaries of the statutory authority were and have the regulations reflect that. Um, a, a broad comment we got, and again, this gets back to this question of where what the appropriate um, structure of the regulation should be. Uh, should it be standards of, of performance or should it be prescriptive standards? And the, and the comment we received here is that the 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 secondary containment systems regulation was a little bit too prescriptive, and that it should be we should make it more flexible, have it be more of a standard of performance, and then let the operators innovate their way to, to figuring out, okay, if I do it this way, I can meet the standard of performance, and that works for me, but maybe it doesn't work for you. And, and if we're very prescriptive in the regulations, it may be that we're putting folks into a, a particular box, and, and then that, that's inappropriate. So, so this is one, this is another one of those areas where um, folks we're suggesting that maybe it ought to be more of a standard of performance and, and allow the industry to meet that standard of performance. Uh, however they get there is, a, is fine. And so this is another one of those areas of comments. Um, we received comments that, that keeping the inspection and maintenance records for the containment structures was at the well site was, was um, inappropriate. It wasn't practical. I think especially for some of the long, some of the sites that are in production where there's not a lot of, you don't have personnel on the site and there's not a lot of uh, daily activity at the site, it may be more difficult to keep those records available at the site. And so it's, they should be available upon request. They should be required to be maintained and if the department wants to see those records, they can request them from the operator. Um, that was the, the drive on that question. And then, um, I, you know, I, I have here a bullet for stormwater management and really the idea here is that, um, that there needs to be some, some, some more development of this regulation about how stormwater gets managed in these, in these facilities. And, and we're seeing um, actually a bunch of issues now that are popping up. Um, you know, what do you do with stormwater? How do you manage it? It's in the secondary containment. What do you, are you allowed to just open up a sump and discharge it to the surface of the ground? Or is there, does there need to be special handling of that? And just that it needs to be, it needs to be outlined in the, in the regulation in some manner, regardless of where the department comes out on, on how that uh, is supposed to be handled. It's not addressed currently, and it should be, basically. So the next big area is uh, site restoration. And uh, we got a fair amount of comments on site restoration as well. Um, the first comments here um, really go from the, uh, from the environmental side of things, the environmental group side of things. And that basically the idea was that they wanted to see a baseline assessment or uh, included in the restoration plan and, and, and then restoration back to that baseline assessment standard um, for all well sites and all impoundment sites or any site that is required to go through the restoration process. The, the idea here was a request for a requirement that there be some analysis done prior to the, um, prior to the, to the activity occurring so that we can judge the restoration plan as to whether or not it will get you back to that point or not. 
and then at the end of the restoration process, we can say, did, did they get back to that baseline point um, or, or not at the end of the day? Um, professional certification of restoration goals was a broad category of comments that we received on this one as well. Um, that there should be DEP approval before the, before the site can be considered to be fully restored. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then, you know, again, <laughs> here we are on the other side of the, of the continuum that the site restoration standards are unenforceable and inappropriate uh, as written, so that we needed to address some of uh, the concerns that they are. Um, uh, and I think this gets to the original conditions piece, um, both that it's not something that the act requires and that approximate original conditions are, uh, they're not defined. Again, this gets back to the, back, back to the, um, the definitional section. We should have a definition for approximate original contours or approximate original conditions. Because um, you can't quantify what exactly a, uh, those original conditions may end up being, absent a definition. Uh, another broad group of comments we received is that the, the, time, the time limits were inappropriate and it should start when the well is completed, not the completion of drilling. That uh, nine months after the completion of drilling, which is what the proposed rulemaking includes, is uh, not an appropriate time limit because there may be activities that need to occur between completion of drilling and all the other things that need to be done in order to, to put that well into production um, so that it's the, really the appropriate time frame to measure from is completion of the well rather than drilling. And that's something that, um, you know, we'll certainly take into consideration. Um, and then this next one is, is an interesting comment um, and it's obviously not something that we intended to, um, uh, to do and I think it, we sort of got caught with, a, with an inconsistency here which is that the that it allows the, the regulation allows for the written consent of the landowner to deviate from a restoration requirement. So maybe you don't have to go back to original contours if or conditions if the landowner is comfortable with with maintaining the property as it is. Um, but then there's another section in the regulation that says that the restoration has to completely comply with the regulations. And so it just I think is something that we need to correct that um, inconsistency. So uh, you know it's something we'll go back in and take a look at uh, as we go to final. The next section is the reporting and remediating releases section, and I don't think I need to tell this organization or this, this advisory board that folks have some consider, considerable concerns with that. Uh, you know, it's, it, the spill policy was actually uh, amended in 2013 to be more in line with what's in the proposed rulemaking. And so, um, you know, we certainly heard it when the spill policy was being developed, and so uh, no surprise that the, the comments that we got on the proposed rulemaking pretty much uh, parallel and mirror the uh, the uh, comments that we got on the spill policy is something that, um, you know, is inappropriate and, and went beyond the boundaries of what should be required for oil and gas operations. And, and these, these comments kind of reflect that, those same comments, that um, the notice requirements are too stringent and they should, they should track the clean streams law requirements only. Um, lack of statewide standards for chlor chlorides makes uh, implementation of the remediation subsection costly and difficult to implement, which, you know, we certainly understand the concerns there. Um, and that the definition of regulated substances is somewhat uncertain and may result in remediation, reporting and remediation of releases that, that don't necessarily uh, pose an environmental impact threat, but uh, because the definition is so broadly defined, <coughs> excuse me, um, there's going to be some additional work that operators will do that's not necessary. And so we need to sort of tighten down what, what the definition of regulated substances actually is and only make folks address those kind of issues. So, I mean, again, this is one where we, we knew the issues going into the rulemaking and I think coming out on the other side, the, the, the story on this section is that those issues were the issues that were identified and, and uh, there weren't many more that, that came up as a result of that. I think folks had done a, a lot, put a lot of thought into the spill policy discussion and so it tended to reflect that, um, that discussion as well. For borrow pits, uh, we didn't get a we didn't get a whole lot um, we didn't get a whole lot of comments here. The one that we wanted to call out um, on this issue was that um, it was more of like a a project area development concept rather than a well pad development concept, and so that the um, the borrow pits would need to remain active during the entire development in the in the area, not just the not just the initial well pad that they would be used for, and so. The regulation should be clarified to make it clear that restoration is not required until the entire project is completed as opposed to when the first well pad is completed and the time running off of that 
well pad. So, so that's something we'll go back and we'll make sure that, um, uh, that, that that's that, that what we meant there was clear because I don't think I don't think that was something that we meant in the in the proposed rulemaking and we'll go back and uh, take a look at that. So gathering lines uh, is the next section and, and the the comments here tended to. Um, tended to drive more at the authority for the, the section itself rather than the, the, the substantive requirements of the section. Although, as we'll talk here, there are a couple of, um, there's at least one kind of comment here that's a, more of a substance section. And, and the idea here was that the section was really unnecessary because gathering lines were already being addressed by other regulations or statutes, both, both under FERC um, or under PUC requirements. And, and this comment really went to, uh, to both of the subsections that, uh, that address pipeline issues, um, 7868A and 7868B for temporary pipelines. Um, and that's why we sort of included it at this point. Uh, the second comment there is relates to topsoil segregation and that it, while it's a good practice, it's, it may not be feasible to, to uh, segregate topsoil in all circumstances. And so therefore, it should be something that um, is called out as a good practice, a best practice, but not something that's actually required by the regulation. So the next section addresses um, horizontal directional drilling for oil and gas pipelines. Um, the comments there tended to, to uh, be less about the, uh, the authority for the, the section and more about the, the technical requirements um, <clears throat> that applied in these situations. Um, the first one there, that it wasn't practical or reasonable for industry to have to report the loss of all drilling fluid circulation, particularly when the fluid does not come to the surface. Uh, I think that one's pretty straightforward. It has to do with the, uh, with the uh, reporting of, of drilling fluids and, uh, and when, when there's loss of circulation. So just basically the, 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 statute or the regulatory provision was, was overly prescriptive and too broad. Um, that we should include in this regulation uh, provisions for the beneficial reuse of those drilling fluids. Uh, I think that's something we would certainly take into consideration and that the, the PPC plan requirements were unclear and somewhat redundant. And so we needed to do some work on the PPC plan provisions as part of this section, um, if not eliminating them altogether. I think, um, I think really there were two, two thrusts to the, those kind of comments. One was that they needed to be clarified and the other was that they were unnecessary and so we'll have to take a look at, uh, at those comments to figure out if we need to make changes or if it needs to be uh, simply re eliminated altogether. Uh, the next section is the temporary pipeline section um, and this was an interesting one. Um, the, the way that the proposed rulemaking is structured is basically says that uh, the operator cannot have joints or couplings um, for these temporary pipelines in the area uh, where it's going to go across the stream. And the comment here was that uh, you may end up in a situation where the width of the stream actually exceeds the length of, the, of a section of the temporary pipe, and therefore there's going to need to be some joint or coupling if you're going to get across that stream. It just, it, in some cases, it just may be impossible to get all the way across. And so uh, the, the language should change from no joints or couplings to a minim, the minimum number required uh, type of a comment. So that was one that uh, we'll, we'll take a look at and we'll go back and, and try to figure out if that's appropriate. Um, there was uh, also some comment about the inspections of the temporary pipelines, um, how often they have to occur, and how they need to be documented. And this was one that um, we got from we got from everybody uh, that commented on this section of the regulations. We got it from the industry groups, and we got it from the environmental groups. Uh, it's uh, something that I think we'll need to go back in and take a look at to see, just to make sure that it's crystal clear that what we need folks to do is is. Is, in, is outlined there in black and white, and that it, um, it, uh, it's, it's clear on, on its face. The next section talks about uh, water management plan 7869. Um, we got a few comments on, on water management plans. Uh, that, again, this, is, this was a theme that we saw throughout the, the, the proposed rulemaking comments that we received was that, you know, that we ought to be doing things to encourage the recycling reuse of, of uh, flowback water in Pennsylvania. And so under the water management plan provisions, we needed to have an avenue, uh, you know, so that the process was clear and didn't get in the way of, of the actual substantive act activity of moving water from 
one well site to another well site or a centralized impoundment in between. And so uh, the water management plan provisions really needed to make sure that they that they sort of didn't get in the way, if you will, of, of that occurring. And, and to the extent that there was process that was necessary or um, forms and reporting, that kind of stuff, that, that we would able, would be, it would be able to be done and that it would be able to be done in a manner that was, um, uh, you know, allowed the proper flexibility to, to encourage these, these materials to be able to move in, a, in an appropriate manner. Um, we also got comments that we needed to include uh, provisions that would allow for water source locations outside of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to be included in, uh, in the water management plan because obviously we have a, a fair, fairly lengthy border from uh, on the western side with Ohio and West Virginia and, and the north with, uh, with New York. And uh, there may be source locations that are going to be located outside of the Commonwealth that, that would be appropriate for that development but um, wouldn't necessarily be captured under the proposed rulemaking for water management plans. And so that was just something that we should add as a, as uh, make it explicit that it would be something that would be allowed and that it would be uh, somehow accounted for as part of the water management plan itself. And the, the last bullet there is that there should be um, a process for how uh, water management plans get amended and renewed. There's when you look at the structure of the regulation, it's pretty clear how an, a water, an operator comes in and gets their original water management plan approved, but there's no process there with the exception of uh, sort of expiration and renewal. There's a, there's a mention of renewal, but that's, it's really more of a mention than something that talks about what the process is going to look like. And so we just need to be clear in the process about this is how it's going to operate. Here's, here's who you need to talk to. Here's what you need to submit. Here's how you need to... Uh, when the department has to respond, all those kind of things, what needs to be approved and what can simply be submitted. Um, and so we're going to need to add some additional language here, I think, probably uh, adding a little, putting a little bit of meat on the bones of how those, um, how those water management plants get approved. So the last sections that we received um, really major comments on, I, and, I, and I will say we, we did receive a little bit of commentary on some of the later sections, but for the most part, with the exception of 7873, which is the well construction and operation section that talks about alteration of wells in the event of the abandoned orphan wells, um, the, the, the the changes after the after the section that after the section that we'll talk about now, road spreading, tended to be more in the nature of changing citations to the statute or in the, the case of, the one, there is one other sub, slightly substantive change, but it simply mirrors the language in the statute under well reporting for well records in section 78122 uh, and completion reports. Um, there, there really isn't substantive change after this provision in the section, in the proposed rulemaking, excuse me, uh, after this section. So this will be the last sort of substantive section that we discuss. And, um, I, but I, I wanted to at least mention that while there's another you know, uh, 14 pages or, I, well, not quite that many, seven or eight pages of regulation that follow 78870 and 7870A. Um, and we did receive comments on some of those, those sections. Um, we looked at the process as we're not really making substantive changes to those sections outside of 7873, and those were really addressed when we talked about 7852A and the, and the Abandoned and Orphan Well Survey. Those, those when I talked about the scope of response, that was really directed at actually at 7873. But I wanted to at least touch base here because there are a lot of folks who submitted comments on some of those later sections uh, that we're not going to talk about today, primarily because they, we consider those to be outside of the scope of, the rule, of this particular rulemaking. Um, so before we get into the last section, I, I thought it was probably appropriate to mention that. So the last two substantive sections to discuss are um, 7870, which is the road spreading of brine for dust control and road stabilization, and then 7870A, which is pre-wetting, anti-icing, and de-icing. And um, the the current structure of the program is that we we already we have a we have a program in place for road spreading of brine for dust control and road stabilization. The, the de-icing, um, pre-wetting, and anti-icing was was previously approvable under a waste management general permit, which has since expired, and so we're we're bringing that concept back in as part of this regulation, uh, and that's what these regulations drive at. So the first comment we received, again, which was a fairly broadly submitted comment, was that, um, frankly, this was an inappropriate 
uh, use of uh, brines, for, uh, and it shouldn't be allowed. It should be flatly prohibited. Um, it's uh, for all the, the concerns that you would imagine would be raised, clean streams, law concerns, water pollution, um, some hazardous materials or um, radio radiation type concerns, that, that this is something that should just be banned outright and prohibited. Um, again, on the, on the flip side of that point, the, the statute, or the, pardon me, the proposed regulations do propose that, that uh, the road spreading of brines from unconventional wells be, be prohibited. Um, so there is an outright prohibition for brines from those wells, particular wells. Uh, this comment is directed at that, and the comment is that it's really scientifically in a, uh, unsupportable. From, uh, there's no scientific basis for saying this type of water, produced water is, is okay to spread on a road, but this type of water is not. Um, it shouldn't matter what type of well the, the, the brine comes out of. It should be how the, what, that, what that brine looks like when you do your analysis as to whether or not it's appropriate for these uses. So that's something that we'll have to take, go back and take a look at in terms of, the, uh, in terms of the, uh, whether or not we, we, we retain that, that prohibition. Again, this is one of those areas where we're going to be looking at a wide range of comments from outright prohibition to appropriate in all circumstances with with certain controls put in place. And so we're gonna to have to wrestle with, okay, where do we end up on that continuum uh, after we've had a chance to review all the comments? Um, another comment here, which sort of drives at the, at the first comment, which was that um, these, these regulations don't ensure adequate compliance with anti-degradation for waters of the Commonwealth, and they don't contain adequate chain of custody requirements uh, in terms of, okay, I've. I'm the operator, I've generated this brine, I've given it to this municipality for use on their roads under an approved plan. Um, you know, where's the, is there a chain of custody that shows that I delivered it to them on such and such a date and they, they, they actually applied it on such and such a date that I guess the comment is that the record keeping requirements are not, are not substantial enough and need to be updated. Um, you know, and you can, you can read the rest about um, about the cost-benefit analysis that would, would occur here as well. And the last comment to make about this one is that um, it was a legal comment, and the legal comment is that this should be subject to regulation under the Solid Waste Management Act, not the Oil and Gas Act, and therefore it should be regulated under Chapter 287 rather than Chapter 78. Um, so it's a, so we've, out, we've exceeded the, the, the boundaries of our authority, and, and it should be in a different per place and not, not in these regulations. So again, like, as with all the other legal comments, we'll, do, well, work with our crack legal staff to, uh, to, to, to provide appropriate responses to those, uh, to that legal comment as well. So that kind of wraps up uh, the, the, the very high level overview of the substance of the, of the comments that we received on the proposed rulemaking. Uh, and we wanted to talk a little bit about the next steps here. As I mentioned, um, you know, the next thing for us to do now that we've sort of got a comment and response document that's, um, I'll call it 98, 99% complete. We're still going through and making sure the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. And, and to the extent that we can compress it, we can compress it. I don't know, how many pages are we up to now? Is it, uh, yeah. we're, we're around 700 pages on this comment and response document right now. And that's just the comments. That's just taking the comments out of the, the documents that were submitted to the department and putting them into a, 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 you know, a Microsoft Word document that, that just contains the language of the comments. We're up around 700 pages, so you know, we've got to sit down and we've got to go through those comments. And some of, some of our effort at this point is really in cons consolidation. I mean, there's, there are comments that we said, okay, here's a comment from commentator X and here's a comment from commentator Y, and we just put them in the comment response document. And to the extent we could on the fly, we, we tried to do a little bit of that consolidation, but now we're kind of going back through with a finer tooth comb and a closer eye to see okay, maybe these really are the same comments and we can, we, can, we can delete this second one and only have them in one. And if you've looked at a comment and response document before, the typical way they're structured is you've got a comment. The comment is, you know, pitch should be disp banning, uh, I'm sorry, disposal of produced water on pit and pitch should be banned, period. That's the comment. And then underneath that, you'll have a, a parenthetical with the list of commentator numbers that have submitted that comment. And, the, and in the... In the Initial parts of the comment and response document, there's usually a list of commentators. So then you can cross-reference. Commentator one is range resources. Commentator two is Joe Smith from Tunkanic, Pennsylvania. Commentator three is Earth Justice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. And then you can go back and you can see from that point who actually submitted that comment and get some sense of, of who, those, who, who those folks were. 
Um, so we're, we're, we're doing that now. Um, we're trying to consolidate that down. And then, and then we're going now, and the next step is, from our perspective, is to start to step through that document and start to prepare responses to those comments. Um, you know, some of them are going to be responses that just say, thank you very much for your comment. Um, some of them are going to be much more substantive, like the, the comments we received about the financial analysis on the conventional side of things. We're going to have to do a very, very detailed response to that comment. Uh, and, that, and, and as we develop that detailed response to that comment, that will form our decisions about uh, where the, the draft final rulemaking starts to, to, starts to go. And I'll tell you, frankly, that some of the provisions that you see in this proposed rulemaking will appear in that first draft of the final rulemaking, because we're, we're convinced that even after going through all the comments we received on all of these issues, we're still convinced that we were right when we, when we came up with the final, with the proposed rulemaking at the initial stage. Um, I don't think that's unusual, and I think that that's, you know, certainly to be expected in some cases. In other cases, we're going to look at this and we're going to say, you know what, we're convinced that we were completely missed the boat on this one, and we're either going to delete that section or we'll make significant changes to it, um, or we'll add something that we didn't have in here before because something's been brought to our attention that we needed to address appropriately. Um, in terms of where we go next with the draft final rulemaking, you know, we've got a bullet here that says, we're going to try to get a draft final form rule to the technical advisory board sometime later this year. Um, there is a September meeting scheduled at this point. Uh, that's the last meeting that's scheduled for the year. I would not be surprised if we went back to the advisory board and suggested that perhaps another meeting be scheduled um, because September is, uh, is a lot closer than a lot of us like to think about. And you know, when you look at 700 pages of comments to try to grind through as much of that as possible, and really, yeah, you know, give it the real thorough consideration that I think it's really, I think we have a statutory obligation to do, but I think also we have a, a professional obligation to do to the, to the industry and to the citizens of the Commonwealth because, you know, people took a lot of time and effort to pull these comments together. And, and like I said, they are very thoughtful comments. They are thorough comments. And I think we have an obligation as the Department of Environmental Protection to, to really pay attention to what people are saying and, 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 and very thoughtfully consider those comments as we try to move towards a draft final rule. Um, I Kurt, think, Kurt, so sure, the, go ahead. the comment response document would be released with these draft final form? To the extent that we have it finished, absolutely. I mean, I don't see any problem with making those documents available. I, the question is, um, you know, is it going to be in a form that's going to be able to, I mean, we may be able to say to, some, to, to, to TAB, we think that the final regulation ought to look like this. We're still drafting, working on cleaning up the comment response document to support that decision. But, um, you know, we're not going to be in a situation where uh, the regulation gets finalized from our perspective of putting together a draft final form reg, but it gets finalized without having done that consideration and done and, and really looked hard at those comments and tried to figure out where does it make sense to make changes, where does it make sense to keep things the way they are. So um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be moving too far down the line and having the draft regular final form regs without having the, the, the substantive consideration in the comment response document. It's just a question of you know, how much of that is going to be finished at the time that we get to get to coming back to the tab. And, and, and I'll be honest that the department really hasn't made any decisions about, you know, do we wait until everything's finished and then from our perspective and then come back? Do we, do we pick up particular issues and come back to the technical advisory board and say, we want to have a more in-depth discussion like we did last year on, on the issue of abandoned well surveys? Because you know what, it, the comments that we got on this issue were so far all over the map that that we have some ideas about what we think is important, but maybe we need to reach out to folks to say, you, you, com you submitted these comments to us about this issue. We'd like to, we'd like to have a in more in-depth discussion with you because there's, because there's still some substantive issues that we have questions about and we're at, we have uncertainties about as it moves forward. So it's entirely possible that we're going to get to a situation where um, we break certain issues out of the, out of the whole and say, let's have a discussion about this. And we may not. I mean, maybe the, as we go through these comments, we decide that uh, it's, that's really not necessary at this point in time because, because, it's, because it is clear. I mean, everybody has put all the cards on the table, and there really aren't any more cards to be dealt at that point. And, and, and we feel like we can get our arms wrapped around that and, 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 and come to a decision from our perspective about what the regulation should look like and then bring that back and have that follow-on discussion as uh, here's a decision we've made as opposed to we're still considering the decision and can we have some more in-depth discussion technically or, or substantively about this 
about this issue. Um, obviously, once we come back with a final form reg, we're going to—it's not going to be something where that gets fixed, and we're going to say to you all, you know, can you approve this reg based on these now 1,200-page comment and response document? Um, you know, we'll give it to you two weeks before the meeting and expect you to come back and have, uh, right. you know, have that done. Obviously, that's not the plan in, in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I think that, Curtis, your, sure, uh, Art. your intention also by the fall of this year to have the legal questions answered by that time, or is that going to be at a later date? Well, it wouldn't be something that we would come back with um, in terms of, in terms of, I mean, that, obviously we have to make sure that the legal questions are answered as well as the substantive questions before we come back on any of these issues. So, so even taking the even taking the road spreading of Brian issue, which is which is a, has been raised as a legal issue. We'd have to get the review from, from Liz and the folks in the Office of Chief Counsel before we step out with another proposal or, or draft final rulemaking. And I think that the, uh, you know, we have an obligation, I think, to answer any legal issues that are raised in, a, in an appropriate manner, and we'll, we'll certainly do so, I think. Uh, you have anything you want to add? Or? No, I just, the fundamental to making any changes to the to the annex A will be resolving a lot of those those legal questions. So yes, to the best of our ability, of course. You know, I mean, obviously, the, there's judicial review that's going to have a have a great deal of say about anything we have to say about the legal requirements and, and what the rulemaking looks like. Um, and I will say, uh, with the tip of my hat to the to the lawyers in the audience, because uh, I was one at one point. Uh, we got some very interesting legal arguments as part of this comment period, and I can almost see the briefs being written for the, the legal challenges that are going to come if we, if the regulation proceeds as drafted on proposed. But, and I mean that for across the spectrum. I don't, you know, I, it's not. I'm not pointing fingers in any particular direction. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people have some very strong legal arguments uh, on all sides of these issues. Um, so the, the thinking is that, that that we start the process of drafting the final form reg regulations later this year. We come back to the tab on several occasions. I think it's going to require several meetings um, through the rest of 2014 and the spring of 2015 to, to, to really try to nail these issues down and, and hammer this out um, with the possibility of this leading up to an advance notice of final rulemaking sometime next year. I think, um, excuse me, I, it, we're, we're trying to be real careful about making a promise about the advance notice of final rulemaking at this point because while we did receive significant across-the-board comments, it's not clear that there's going to be um, significant across the, enough across-the-board changes to, to justify that process. It does add, uh, you know, I would say it's going to, it would back up the process by at least three or four months because you have a 30-day comment period. We have to go back and we have to digest those comments just like we're digesting the current comments. Um, so there is a balance there to be weighed between the, the delay in the, in the process versus uh, the type of commentary we're going to get beyond. I, I'm still submitting the same comment that I gave to you before on that same issue because you didn't change your mind, DEP. Uh, I, I, my gut is that, that there's going to be an advance notice of final rulemaking just because I can't imagine that there aren't going to be significant enough changes to this. But, but we're not certain about that. Um, but if it were to occur, I'm expecting probably sometime second quarter, you know, April, May time frame of next year would be the earliest we would be getting around to that. And again, that gets published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. That document goes out. It's, it's a document of the department, not a document of the Environmental Quality Board, so it does not go through the full Environmental Quality Board process. It's something that informs what we eventually um, send to the Environmental Quality Board for approval. So if that were to occur, you know, the, the, yeah, we'd have an outside shot at getting to the EQB sometime uh, fall next year. And, and when I say fall, I, I really mean more like uh, late third quarter would be my guess, like October, November. Well, I guess November's, October, November was getting into fourth quarter. Late September, early October would be somewhere I would think that we might get back to the Environmental Quality Board. And if that was the case, assuming it got approved and, and went through the, the Attorney General's Office and the Independent Regulatory Review Commission, I would say an effective date of um, sometime in 2016 is probably, the, is probably my best guess based on my professional um, experience as to when we might go back as a, as a final rulemaking. So. So I appreciate your uh, I appreciate your attention. Uh, I know that that's a lot to get through, and some of it's quite dry. But we did want to make sure that we we uh, tried to provide as comprehensive of a picture of the of the commentary that was received on the proposed rulemaking to TAB and to the to the public, so that um, everybody had a good idea of the of the issues that we're going to be grappling with as we get to as we get to the, uh, the, the drafting the final form rulemaking and. 
I think we've set aside a little bit of time anyways for, for questions or public comment. Um, yeah, just let me, just let me, excuse me a minute. Uh, any other questions, Art or Bert for, for Kurt or Liz? Just, just, just one or two, uh, Kurt. The uh, chloride in soil issue, you identified that, that is, is an issue. A lot of people commented on that. At one time we talked about at TAB meetings in the past of, of taking that issue to the Scientific Advisory Board. It, yeah. Do you know, is that happening? Is that moving ahead? It hasn't happened yet, Bert. And the reason why I think is that the, the, the SAB is actually pretty, has been pretty heavily engaged. They actually had a proposed rulemaking that just closed, the comment period just closed on May 17th. So they've been updating their standards based on new EPA risk assessment guidance, I believe. Right. And it was a pretty significant undertaking for them to get there. I mean, when you look at it, I think something crazy like 75 or 80 percent of the uh, medium specific co concentrations in the statewide health standards had to change as a result of that review. So they've been, I mean, they've had their plate pretty full uh, just dealing with their own issues. So it is something that, that is still a concept that we're considering about going back to the SAB to get, get their input on remediation standards and, and, and to take a look around at what other states have, have, how they've wrestled with the issue because obviously Pennsylvania geology isn't such that we're unique in having to deal with this question and, and other states have, have tried to struggle to, have struggled to deal with this question as well. So I think when we move from proposed to final, that's, that survey is gonna be a part of that, that discussion. And whether we put something in, in, in Chapter 78 or we move with the, uh, with the SAB to try to get something developed for 250, I think is an open question. Um, I, don't, I don't see any reason why we couldn't have something in 78 saying, here's, here's how we're gonna address chlorides, whether it's a narrative standard or a, or a quantitative standard, well, you know, whatever it ends up looking like. I think it's something that we're definitely considering as moving okay. forward. The, um, you mentioned the, that the, the year-long radioactive material study is ongoing. Is that, is that pretty much on schedule? Are there any major delays that you're seeing in that? I, I haven't heard of any, frankly. Uh, oh. I know that there was some issues they had with, um, they were trying to get out to some sites for, uh, um, some sites that had uh, like on-site disposal, buried disposal, I think that, that, and they were, they needed a little bit of coordination to get out to those sites earlier this year. But as far as I know, that might have been the last sort of sampling issues that they had to address. Um, I have not heard anything about any delays to, to date, so. Then just one other question. The, the, the issue of, of um, needing to address small business, yeah. I'm not gonna say set aside, that I assume that's being kind of lumped into legal issues. Absolutely, and it, it's actually um, in terms of the uh, probably should I probably should have called it out a little more in terms of the the comments that were received from the conventional industry, especially about the uh, the financial analysis. It was kind of woven into those comments was you know not only did you miss the numbers DEP, but you also needed a bit, you should also be building in a small business um, analysis, but also flexibility in the regulations for, for entities that qualify as small businesses. Thanks. Thanks, Bert. Art? Uh, Kurt, I was glad to hear that you've tested, uh, you mentioned testing some of the unconventional waste and finding yeah. no reason to not uh, be able to apply that perhaps on the surface. Uh, have you done, all, done that as well on the conventional side since there's so many sites out there that have reported uh, spread, uh, spreading on site? Sure. And well, not recently. I mean, the, 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 the drill cutting study that I'm talking about occurred in um, 2012, was it? So that was really, that one's fairly recent. But the department has historically taken a look at, at uh, drill cuttings from the conventional or vertical portions of, the, of these wells. And, and the current regulations really reflect our best thinking about when it's appropriate to, to allow for that activity to occur on a well site, either burial or land application. And those, those, the current regulations in Chapter 78 are actually based on those earlier studies. Uh, I think there's some from the 1990s, maybe, or uh, so. So we're pretty comfortable with what was what was being seen there. Um, obviously, with the newness of the of the of the shale development, it was something we felt we needed to take another look at to make sure that we were comfortable with applying the Chapter 78 regulations as they stand in that case too. So, some of your comments about. Uh uh, storage of uh, waste material, residual waste. You mentioned that Pennsylvania has very little capacity for, st for storage injection of yeah. those uh, uh, materials. Is that because of departmental policy or is that based on some um, 
study that you've done or? Well, it's actually, uh, EPA actually runs the injection control program in Pennsylvania, Region 3. Um, the, the Commonwealth has never taken primacy for that program. I think w the, the way it's been explained to me uh, in, the, in the past is that most of the areas where you might have found a uh, injection well formation, so depleted formation that folks are going to inject back into, in Pennsylvania tends to be used for gas storage. And so the higher economic value of, of those formations, depleted formations, is to re-inject natural gas so that you can, and, and the way it was explained to me was that you inject the natural gas when it's being produced in July but not being used, and you, maybe you could only sell it for 330 uh, thousand cubic feet and then you take it out of the storage field in January when you can sell it for nine dollars a thousand cubic feet to New York or New England or wherever and the Pennsylvania given our, our pipeline structure and our, our sort of uh, proximity to those using markets the, the, where, the, where the natural gas is being consumed uh, really made us a, a prime location for gas storage as, a, as an industry to be developed and that that's the higher economic use and so it's really that's really more the issue here. I've also heard some things about our geology isn't quite as good as, as Ohio's, but I, you know, I don't know about that for sure. Um, but I, you know, we we've we've been pretty neutral about whether or not injection wells should be dis developed or not. I mean, it's it's for us, it's um, you know, it's as long as somebody meets our standards, we'll issue the well permits that need to be that need to be approved. It's, it's so it's not something that we've taken a position on, good, better, and different. It's just. Um, you know, if the, if the permit applications don't come in, we, we can't approve them. And so it just seems like it hasn't been developed to date. Um, but, but you have not taken primacy, so you're not... No, we don't, we don't, we don't actually issue the permits. It's, a, it's right out of EPA. And frankly, from what I've seen, the other states that do have primacy, their, their programs pretty much model EPAs. I mean, they have to, get, they have to get, go through that approval process by EPA anyway. So it's, they're pretty much very similar. So I don't think Pennsylvania would have many... There's no, I don't see a regulatory barrier in Pennsylvania to, as opposed to like West Virginia or Ohio or something like that. I do know that other states, when they issue the well permit, sometimes they require a uh, development of, you have to be able to show, here's the waste we project that we're going to generate and you have to show how it gets disposed of mm -hmm. up front when the permit's actually issued. And so I think in West Virginia is one of those states. And so a lot of times operators will actually get a permit for an injection well at the same time they're getting their their well permits, and then they'll, cause, and it's like a captive injection well, where I'm going to send all my produced water and all my all my flow back to that particular well because I I operate that well. Right. Um, and we don't have that here in Pennsylvania, so it's it's less of a, I think there's less of a of a regulatory reason to to, to have that industry developed. So. Is that it, Art? Yeah. Okay. I think we're I think we're a little bit behind, right? About 15 yes, minutes. Yes, we are. But yeah. we had four people had signed up to provide okay. comment, and, I, and uh, I don't know if it was uh, the intent of any one of you four to actually comment at the end uh, later this afternoon, or if you want to, in fact, do it now. Uh, so I'll just call out your name if you would prefer to wait until uh, the comment period this afternoon. Just let me know. We'll just pass pass you by and hold you in reserve. Um, so you have two minutes to provide comment, and uh, first one is uh, Benita Hope. Yeah. I'd like to do it now. Okay. I was wondering if I was going to be too short for this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the transparency of this whole process. We thank the board and we thank uh, the league, thanks the department. It certainly is in keeping with our uh, policies on providing citizen input, providing transparency, and taking all those comments seriously that were given. I would not want your job of having to distill all that information. Uh, as you probably know, this has taken the League of Women Voters uh, somewhat outside of their, their usual realm of activities, and uh, we have performed a statewide study on the subject and it's interesting to me to listen to them speak now. Uh, those uh, ladies and gentlemen who uh, were primarily interested in voter registration and, and issues of that sort, election services issues, are now talking, using words that they never used before and doing so very knowledgeably. And so we are keeping up with the times. Um, First, we again want to uh, express our thanks for the transparency. 
Uh, and second, in regard to the summary of comments received on proposed rulemaking 25 PA chapter uh, 78, we noted that your review underscored issues of importance to both the industry and the public. In light of Article 1, Section 27 of Pennsylvania's Constitution, we believe that the citizens' right to clean air, pure water, and the preservation of natural resources should take precedence in guiding the final regulations. It is the DEP as trustee of these resources and not the permit applicant who should be responsible for such requirements as the determination of proposed activities affecting threatened and endangered species. Third, while reference is given to legal and scientific basis for the prohibition of certain disposal practices in the summary, such a legal and scientific basis is fundamental for all natural gas regulations. This is critical in promoting the maximum protection of public health and the environment as advocated by our positions and consistent with the mission of the department. And last, the League believes that best practices should be required and updated on an ongoing basis. Words and phrases included in comments such as practical, feasible, costly, and difficult to implement should not thwart the adoption of st strict regulations. Strict mandates are laudable when balanced against real costs and evolving threats to public health and the environment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hope. Teresa McCurdy. And Teresa, go ahead and give your name and affiliation once you get up to the microphone. Hi, I'm Teresa McCurdy of TD Connections. I uh, actually want to thank everyone for your work as well. Uh, I work with the uh, industry through Pioga and some other clients. Um, and it was through that that I'm actually uh, standing in for someone who could not make it today. And I don't know whether or not you can answer this or not, but here, here's the question. Paragraph four on page three of the April 14th, 2014, ERC comments to the EQB DEP on chapter 78 proposal explicitly states that the PA Supreme Court in the Robinson Townsend case, or Act 13 case, invalidated sections 32B through E of Act 13 and enjoined the applications of those sections. These sections, as you know, are the regula regulations implementing the operative public resources sections of the Act that include, among other things, the statement that the statutory language, critical community, means special concerned species. So his question is whether or not a yes or no answer only as to each section, the DEP is now working on and preparing to continue to propose regulations or changes to the proposed regulations pursuant to the authority prescribed in first is the subsection 32B. He wanted a yes or no if possible. Well. If that's, I don't, not, I don't, if that's not possible, yeah, then I don't, not. I don't, I'm not going to ask Mr. Klapkowski at this point to say yes or no to that. I, you did mention your, that's yeah, one of the I, issues I you're I mean, I think at. that my answer would be the department is going to consider all the comments received and, and, uh, and act appropriately. And when I said, you know, at the end that, that some of the, I took my hat off to my lawyer colleagues for their, for their incisive legal commentary. Um, this is one of those issues where, again, we got the spectrum and it was interesting to me, uh, from with, given my background, is I almost thought, felt like I was reading briefs of the uh, the post in, post enactment challenge of these regulations. Whichever way the regulation goes, if it drops out or if it stays in, uh, so uh, we have a wide spectrum of legal commentary that we need to consider when, as we go to go to final. And and so the answer, the short answer is, we are going to consider all the legal comments we got. Some of the legal commentary goes in the direction of the department has has. Uh, explicit authority in the, under the Constitution to have these regulations. Other commentary, like the Pioga comments, basically said this was invalidated by the Supreme Court and you can't have these regulations. So, so there's a regulatory authority question there that we're going to turn to our legal office and say, can you give us a, can you give us a read on this, what the proper legal read of this is? And, and the answer, the outcome will be determined on what that analysis reveals. So, so yes, we are still working on it because we have to, because, because the, the the question was raised on both sides, and we simply can't say these folks are right or these folks are right. We have to, we actually have to right. sit and weigh it. 
Okay. So no yes or no at this point. That's Teresa. what I thought. I'm just okay. being the messenger. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Tanya Wagner? No longer here. I don't know. I'm, I'm here. Oh, okay. But I did not know I was to speak. Oh. I don't know I so from. somebody signed you up without your authorization? They right? know that. I <laughs> okay. testified in January. All right. You can just take my comments. Oh, yeah, maybe you just signed the I just signed. I thought okay. that was great. Okay. Okay. So, How about Bill Schneider? Same, same, same thing. Same thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that concludes uh, the morning in? session then. Um, what, what's the rules for anybody that's online? Do they, they, they're going to get a blue screen? They need I, to log off? And I think that the, uh, we're, we're, this, was, this is actually the end of this webinar, and there's another webinar that we'll start. Okay. Um, do we need to, I mean, we're pretty close to on schedule. We're only about 10 minutes behind, but I, should we start, should we start at one instead? Can we, can we switch that? That'll give folks a What's couple extra thoughts? minutes. I mean, if you guys are comfortable with pushing the agenda back just a little bit. Um, well, if, if people are actually going to go out and grab something to eat, if we're all going to just sit around here for the next uh, 45 minutes I or, think, you know. I think people will need to leave, so. Okay. People want to leave? All right, we'll see you back here. Back here at 1, one o'clock. Bright and sharp. Okay. All right. Uh, this session then is, uh, is uh, adjourned.